Good morning. I'm Zenobia Barlow, and I'm executive director and one of the co-founders of the Center for Eco-Literacy in Berkeley. <laughs> Thank you. We're dedicated to education for sustainable living, uh, something we call engaged eco-literacy. So I'm here, and I'm honored to be here, to introduce Karen Brown, the creative director of the Center for Eco-Literacy. Uh, returning each year to Bioneers is, uh, feels like a homecoming, and I want to thank Kenny and Nina and JP and all the wonderful people at Bioneers who have made it possible for us to present our work to all of you for the last two decades and also to serve as advisors um, and uh, friends in Bioneers education-related initiatives. We feel particularly uh, deeply connected to Bioneers because so many of you are so deeply engaged in education. And even if you're not engaged directly in education, we know that you are likely to share our uh, dedication to uh, ecological values um, and understanding in the future generations. So with all the imagination and ingenuity that educators bring to the practice of teaching and learning every day, why would an organization like ours need and want a creative director? And frankly, we yearned for a creative director because we serve such a discerning audience. We know that parents, teachers, and students, for them, time is precious and scarce. Sometimes we feel like we have like a nanosecond to communicate effectively, and we value that moment. Karen recognizes that design works when it's useful and beautiful. Her design goal is to develop, along with the center's team of writers and educators, useful and beautiful resources that speak to people about what they care about most. Karen uses design to further understanding, to evoke reverence, and to provide resources that are consistent with the very quality educators encourage in their students. Clarity, originality, beauty, intelligence and respect, and from time to time, a little bit of wit and humor. <laughs> from Karen's perspective, the first rule of design is to know when to stop. We feel that everyone deserves some quiet space that isn't jammed up with content, and we regularly fee receive feedback about our white space that we so intentionally create in our communications White space is that blank place on the page or the screen where there's absolutely nothing, just the blessing of emptiness. Karen thinks viewers also uh, deserve some very lovely imagery of nature and of young learners and type that's big enough to read comfortably. <laughs> Useful and beautiful. So what else can I share with you about Karen? Karen prefers things the way they look before they're finished. She's the daughter of an engineer, and she has an abiding affinity for nerds. She has won lots of awards. Her work has been included in the Cooper Hewitt the National Design Museum, the Smithsonian Institution, Architectural Digest, House Beautiful, The New York Times, and The Today Show. Karen appreciates everyone who's working to bring back the making of things into everyday life. Karen really likes tiny houses. She's a graphic designer, she's a web designer, and she makes chandeliers by hand. She's descended from an ancient line of Italian gardeners, and she's a dedicated home cook. I think you'll discover that she's also a wonderful presenter. Please welcome Karen Brown. everybody. <laughs> you know, the best educated countries in the world are some of the same ones who are living the least sustainably. So you might say we have two problems. One of them is education, and the other one is the way that we're treating the environment. And maybe by changing education, we could learn ways to take better care of the planet that we all depend on. Now, you could also say, how did we get here in the first place? 
<laughs> how did we get here in the first place? I mean, how did we educate generations of people without any of them learning about ecological principles or how nature sustains life or systems thinking? How did we unleash these kinds of graduates on the world? I mean, what would a person who was educated in this way even look like? Um, they would look a lot like me. <laughs> because I was raised in Long Beach, California, at a time when the schools there were considered to be among the best in the world. And there were two big cultural forces that really affected the education that I received. One of them was the entertainment industry, because we were right next door to Hollywood. And the other one was the high-tech industry, because Southern California was the home of aerospace. And there was a place, a very special place, that really influenced me in terms of my education, and it's where technology, entertainment, and education came together. And that place was Disneyland. <laughs> I'm the one on the right. Disneyland, and the place in Disneyland where the lines were the longest, and where I always wanted to go first was Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland is where I could ride a flying saucer and meet my robot companion, and where I could also experience serious scientific and educational exhibits like this one, the TWA Moonliner, <laughs> designed to show us what recreational space travel would be like in the far-off year of 1986. <laughs> this exhibit was designed by two giants in technology, Werner von Braun, a rocket scientist who's been called the father of the U.S. space program, and Howard Hughes, a world leader in commercial aviation. You could not have assembled a more successful and believable team. And how did these two gentlemen say that we were going to go to the moon? Well, we were going to do it about the same way we were going to do everything else in Tomorrowland, by using clean, abundant, cheap nuclear energy. <laughs> and these messages that there were no limits, and that I could go anywhere I wanted and do anything I wanted, affected every part of my young life. So even though I grew up next door to Orange County, and even though it was really hard to take a picture of the Matterhorn at Disneyland without the orange trees getting in the way, you know, just like in Switzerland, <laughs> and even though I, my family grew oranges in our own backyard, I didn't drink orange juice when I was growing up. I drank tank. It was very natural tasting. <laughs> and I drank Tang because Tang is what the astronauts drank. And I had to condition my body for space travel. <laughs> These messages affected my love life. And they also came straight into my classroom with books like these that taught me that I will go to the moon and showed me step by step exactly how I would get there, including being able to take a bouncy walk with my dad. <laughs> and it also came through in books like these, a signed reading from my school librarian that taught me how we were going to solve problems on Earth here in the future. Problems like population and resource depletion and pollution, and the way these books taught me that we were going to solve these problems was by leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and colonizing outer space. And you know, we actually really did send some people to the moon, and that's a pretty incredible engineering and cultural achievement for human beings. That's astounding. But if you notice, they all came back to Earth. <laughs> and to the problems that we have here, in fact, just a few years 
after the first people landed on the moon, and I was a big girl in high school, I was not looking out the window of my spaceship at the universe. I was looking at things like this, gas lines, and trying to think through on my own how we were going to handle problems like resource depletion and population and pollution. So what might have prepared me better? And what education might have been more appropriate for living sustainably on Earth? Earth. Well, that's the work that we do at the Center for Eco-Literacy. We work with educators and teachers and schools and school administrators from over 400 cities on six continents. And our mission is education for sustainable living on Earth. <laughs> And I'm here to show you some examples of real schools doing real work today um, that we find incredibly hopeful, smart, and vital. Examples like this, which is a little wind turbine that came to us from a teacher in the UK. His name is Jonathan Peel, and he's at the Long Eaton School, which is a public school, public in our sense, anybody can go, in England. And I've got one right here. This generates electricity, and it's made out of recycled cans. And here's one of his students making it. And they're really small, you know, they're really cute. Um, and their inherent adorableness um, opened up a lot of um, great inquiry for the students because they started to think about issues of scale. For example, here's a conventional commercial wind turbine. <laughs> and please don't misunderstand me. I'm an advocate of this kind of power, too. But as you have all recognized, these are big. So they're very expensive to build, and they're expensive to maintain. And they're big, so they're really visible. And they can kind of tear up ridgeline and coastline. And a lot of people object to that. And also, they're big. And therefore, <laughs> <laughs> and therefore they're sometimes sort of centrally located and centrally main, you know, controlled, sometimes by just a few people. So what? could we do, for example, what could we learn about other ways that energy could be distributed if we considered that maybe nature could be our teacher? This is one of our Smart by Nature principles um, from our book that was written by Michael Stone. For example, the students could consider this, a field of wildflowers. And if you notice in nature, nature doesn't create one great big wildflower. <laughs> centrally locate it, <laughs> and then say, if you want to pollinate something, pollinate that. I'm done. <laughs> right? No, nature doesn't centralize. It distributes. And it doesn't isolate. It networks. So this year, the students started networking their turbines together, understanding that by doing that, they could begin to multiply the output. Now, this, so this is an experiment in how small and many could be an alternative to one and big, right? Well, we like this project so much that we took it with us when we co-hosted an all-island conference on sustainability in Hawaii last summer. And this was more popular than I ever could have expected with the teachers there. And here's a couple of reasons why. First of all, did you know that 90% of the energy in Hawaii is imported? mostly in the form of diesel fuel. When you turn on a light switch in a hotel room in Hawaii, you are burning diesel. And here's another thing. They'd use diesel because it's lighter than coal. Otherwise, they'd use coal, right? And here's another thing. These are bales of garbage that are waiting on a dock in Hawaii to be shipped here because they've run out of landfill in Hawaii, and now we don't want their garbage either, right? So this is becoming a major political and sanitation problem in Hawaii. So a project like this little turbine that draws from that waste stream, remember it's made out of recycled cans, that generates electricity that's small so it doesn't tear up ridgeline and coastline, and that's so simple even a child can make it, 
That really resonated with those educators. It's also a demonstration of the principle that the real world is the optimal learning environment. And by real world, we mean, of course, immersion in nature and learning from nature's examples, but we also mean hands-on, project-based learning. This is a headline that really got our attention at the center recently. It turns out that a lot of kids today kind of, sort of, don't really exactly know what a hammer is anymore. <laughs> And we've encountered children at the Center for Eco-Literacy who literally do not know which end of the wheelbarrow to use. And um, why should they? Kids today spend 98% of their time, in, time indoors. They suffer from all kinds of health problems related to sedentary lifestyles. And even though they can type with their thumbs, they're showing declining skills in regards to understanding spatial relationships, mechanical ability, and concrete problem solving. So how are we going to rebuild communities in the way that Kenny was talking about this morning if nobody knows where anything comes from or how anything is made? So these hands-on projects have a value even far beyond the way that they enhance academic learning. Now, nowhere is some hands-on knowledge more valuable than in the area of food. You know, in 1900, 40% of Americans farmed. Today, 1% of Americans farm. And the main reason that's true is because the enormous amounts of energy that have been put into the farming system, from everything from synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and also maintaining an absolutely Byzantine global transportation system that moves food all over the world, right? But just as alarming as this number is this one. The average age of a farmer in the United States is 63 right now. So you've got one person growing food for the other 100, and how much longer are they going to be able to continue to do that? So a pretty significant transition is going to need to happen around agriculture, right? Especially if we start pulling the fossil fuel out of that system, because it's becoming harder to get and more expensive. So I'm going to show you a school that's making the most of its agricultural opportunities, and there's even a catch. These kids are growing food year-round where the winters are 10 below. And this school is Troy Howard Middle School in Belfast, Maine, and these kids are greenhouse farmers. <laughs> this story started like so many that we've heard at the center. It was kind of an 11th hour thing to save one acre of land adjacent to the school that was covered in gravel and scheduled to be turned into a garage, ironically. They got a little grant to build a greenhouse. And the kids wanted to explore how could you do a greenhouse in Maine that would run only on solar energy and that was inexpensive enough that everybody in the community could afford to have one. So this is their design, and this is also a wonderful story about mentors because the spiritual mentor, or if you will, of this project was Elliot Coleman. Yay! <laughs> the famous, beloved, organic Maine greenhouse farmer. So this is an example of how what Elliot Coleman does affects younger people, right? These are some pictures from Elliot's book, The uh, Winter Harvest Handbook. Here are Elliot Coleman's greenhouses in the winter. Here are the kids' greenhouses. Here's the inside of Elliot's greenhouse. You know, you have the outer protective barrier and then that little membrane to protect those young seedlings. And here's how the kids do it. Here's Elliot's greenhouse with the leeks growing out in front. And here's the kids' greenhouse. Because mm -hmm. they've turned this into a year-round program. It's also a wonderful project in the way that it integrates curriculum. For example, here's the kids planting out their first stuff in the spring, and they brought in the math class to figure out how the garden should be oriented, what should the access be, depending on the arc of the sun at their latitude, so that everything's positioned to get the maximum amount of solar energy. This touches on another principle, that sustainable living is rooted in a deep knowledge of place. It is not a one-size-fits-all solution. 
What works in Maine is not going to work in Hawaii. But you can custom tailor solutions if you know about the place that you live so that they fit like a glove. Also, places that are well known tend to be deeply loved and deeply cared for. So here's another example of how sense of place works into this garden project. This is their garden coordinator, John Thurston, and they're taking the temperature of their compost. Now their compost has a special ingredient. It's seaweed because they're in coastal Maine. And seaweed was used for generations in Maine as a soil amendment, but fell out of disuse because chemical fertilizers came in. So one thing the kids are learning in this is a history lesson. But they're also learning a lot more about big cycles in nature. For example, if I take seaweed out of the ocean and put it in my garden, then I eat vegetables that came out of the garden. Is part of the ocean now in me? And am I somehow part of the bigger cycles in nature? A project like this also can unearth misconceptions that young people have. For example, a lot of young people in school really have heard about climate change, but they've heard about it in a narrow kind of way sometimes. For example, in terms of carbon emissions. So some of them have come to think of carbon as a poison. Whereas, in fact, you could just as well call it the backbone of life. Our bodies are made mostly out of oxygen and carbon. So by having a hands-on project where they can actually participate in the carbon cycle, they can learn more about soil, but also more about climate, and more about the really big forces of matter and energy that shape their world. Uh, one of the great things about this project is that it's self-supporting. The garden coordinator told me the reason it works is because it doesn't cost anything. The kids sell organic produce to a co-op in town. They also run a little pizza cafe. <laughs> and they're seed savers. These are non-GMO, non-hybrid, yep. Non-GMO, non-hybrid, organic, hand-gathered, open-pollinated, heirloom seeds adapted to local soils and climate conditions. It doesn't get any better than that, except for this. They also print their own packaging. <laughs> They make linoleum cuts, and they do, all these packages are handmade. And there's another really important aspect to seed saving, kind of the soul of it in a way, because if you garden or you farm, you know it's really hard work. You have to use the big muscles, and you're up against those big forces of nature. But this is the other side of farming, the side where you have to be so tender and caring as you take care of new life and small life. And I think, in a way, that's one of the biggest lessons that we all have to learn, is to know how to be strong and powerful when we need to be strong and powerful, and how to be tender and caring when we need to be tender and caring. Uh, they have a massive, awesome economics program for the seventh graders. I'm just going to show you one item in it. The students use Excel and QuickBooks, and they develop business plans that follow their interest in agriculture. And then they go with a teacher to the Bangor Savings Bank, which is a community bank. And they sit down with a real banker and go through their plan and say, did I think of everything? Is this something that the community might need? Is it something that the community might be interested in? So imagine if you, when you were 12 or 13 years old, had, first of all, that degree of financial literacy, but were also able to follow an interest and have the support of the community so that you could maybe develop a viable local business that provided something essential for your neighbors, right? It's a good example of sustainability being a community practice. It's not a solo act. And just as in nature, networks of living communities come together to sustain life, we in our human communities need to work together. And there's maybe no school that's a better example than that of Midland School in Los Olivos, California. Now, Midland was a school that was founded during the Depression, during tough economic times and a lot of social and political instability. Does any of that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so in 
So for eight decades, they have been working in addition to having a school and exploring what community means. By the way, I understand that Lisey Goddard, who's the Director of Environmental Studies for Midland, is here and has brought a contingent. Could you give us a shout out and let you know where all you guys are? Yeah. <laughs> so here's something that they're learning at Midland. Needs and wants is a through line that runs through everything there, right? The school was founded during the Depression, and part of the ongoing exploration all the time is determining what do I need and what does the school need versus what just something we desire or might prefer to have. For example, the school determined that in order to have a school where people are getting prepared to go to college, you really do need high-speed internet. But they had a lot of conversations around whether or not you need a cell phone. So they decided at Midland, there were not going to be any cell phones. Because <laughs> you don't really need them. Uh, we like the, the needs and wants idea so much that Dr. Carol Lee Sly, who's our education program director, developed a, an activity around needs and wants that you can get for free on our website. I've had a lot of teachers say to me, yeah, yeah, for the classroom, that's great, but I'm taking this home and doing it with my kids. <laughs> This is part of the campus. It's very rustic. They have 2,800 acres down there. But you'll notice something about the buildings. They're not painted, because they had a revelation. If you don't paint, you don't need to repaint. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more resources and more time to do other things, things like this. This is the Midland Solar Program. For the last eight years, the sophomores have worked every year with professional solar installers to expand uh, the solar capability of Midland. I bet that these kids know how to use a hammer. <laughs> because Midland always wants to have multiple positive outcomes from everything that the school engages in, right? So you want electricity, but you also want informed students, yes? And hands-on hands -on is a really great way to get there. And, and needs and wants also flows through to their assignments. They recently had an assignment to study native inse insects in their area, and then they had to produce a model of these insects. Each student had to make a model. And according to the needs and wants ethic at the school, the students were provided with zero materials to make these insects. All they got to have was glue. So here's what smart students can make when you give them absolutely nothing to work with. This is a native tarantula, a fly, a mosquito. Talk about powers of minute observation, huh? Um, they're, they're also very inspired by the work of the environmental ar artist Andy Goldsworthy. Um, so they, yeah. So they have a lot of installations on campus. This is a student named Marcus, who I think is graduating in 2012, is that right? And he's doing a viewing wreath. And here is what you can view through Marcus's wreath. This is Grass Mountain, which is the sacred mountain in their little piece of Earth. Earth, a planet that is so fragile and so beautiful that when astronaut Alan Shepard saw it for the first time as he stood on the surface of the moon, he broke down and cried. Right in his spacesuit. <laughs> but have you noticed, the astronauts had a lot of things to say about space travel, but it's really the things they had to say about their experience of Earth that have stayed with us the longest. For example, here are the words of Scott Carpenter. And you know, if you're a certain age, those names, Alan Shepard and Scott Carpenter, they still have some electricity in them, don't they? Here's what Scott Carpenter said, and here's the kind of thing I never heard from an astronaut when I was in school. This planet is not terra firma. It is a delicate flower, and it must be cared for. It's lonely. It's small. It's isolated, and there is no resupply. And we are mistreating it. Clearly, 
The highest loyalty we should have is number two to the family of man and number one to the planet at large. This is our home and this is all we've got. And I'd like to think we have one other thing, a generation of young people who are healthy, well-educated, ecologically literate, and who know how to be strong and powerful when they need to be strong and powerful, and how to be tender and caring when they need to be tender and caring. Thank you. Thank you.